Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker of today, Dr. William Lowe. He holds a Bachelor in Psychology, a Master and a PhD in Cognitive Science, and he worked at universities such as Harvard, Dublin, Nottingham, Maastricht, Mannheim, and he currently holds the position of a Senior Research Scientist at the Hertie School of Governance here in Berlin. His research spans legislative politics, political economy, and public policy, and his talk today will be on complementary collider bias. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us here today, and the stage is yours. Great, thank you. Um, so thank you for the invitation. Um, also, uh, I very much appreciate that uh, I've been scheduled against an entire causal inference conference. So um, thank you for turning out people with exceptionally bad judgment. Um, there are also um, a certain number of uh, uh, political events that maybe you may be worrying about, um, but uh, so I'll try to be like a little bit of a, a palate cleanser for these, but just for the record, I'm, I'm fairly sure that coalition agreements will work just fine in Saxony and Turingen. Um, okay, so I, I'm going to talk about collider bias, and I'm going to talk about it in a complementary way today. Um, which I think is perhaps not the way that uh, the methods literature think about this. Normally, a collider bias is a bias, it's a problem. Um, so I, I'll, um, I'll try to say something about what kind of a problem it is, and then uh, be a little iconoclastic perhaps, and say, no, actually, there, there are some things you can do with this that are, that are actively interesting. Um, on the way, um, I'll try to, uh, try to explain what it is about like my end of the world, the, uh, the political science uh, part of things uh, that, um, uh, that basically make trouble for, uh, for our, uh, our approach, normal approaches to, um, uh, to causal inference, in particular causal inference with graphs. That is going to be the, the focus today. So let's, let's launch in. Um, we will, well, we will launch in if we can. All right, okay. Um, so we're going to be thinking about directed acyclic graphs. Um, here's one of my favorite uh, graphs. Uh, the, the, the fear of everyone starting off with causal inference is that you would have to, your system is indeed definitely this complicated. Um, but, uh, uh, and the, and the hopes, are, uh, hopes are you can draw some kind of graph um, which will explain it. Um, uh, General McChrystal was not particularly optimistic about um, how, how straightforward this would be. Um, I refer to this as the Afghanistan because it is the situation in Afghanistan in uh, 2009, allegedly. Um, that is a situation that uh, that that we are uh, that we're worried about. The world is indeed complicated. Um, so, because I'm going to talk about collider bias, I'm going to spend a little bit of time um, uh, basically spelling out what I mean, and then we'll talk about um, uh, then we'll talk about the the derogatory and the complementary aspects of it. So let's let's begin. Um, the world may be a complicated place. That's that's true. But just so that we have a foundation here. Um, let's do something uh, in the reverse direction uh, than perhaps you're, you're used to. Um, often we, uh, we assume we have data, we have some access to probability, or we can estimate uh, probability functions, and then we wonder about causation. Um, it's, I think, helpful from uh, when you're thinking about causal inference with directed acyclic graphs in particular, um, to do this in the other way around. So let, let's, let's assume the world is causally structured um, in, uh, in, in mechanism form, and then wonder where the probability comes from. Uh, this is uh, uh, what Strebens refers to as tichomancy, uh, the, the, um, uh, the question, where does the probability come from on the assumption that the causality is, is there? So there's a complicated world uh, in the abstract, not actually particularly complicated. We might be interested in, in just a couple of these variables, maybe X and Y. Um, I've connected them with red there throughout all of these slides, the causal effect, or at least the path that somehow has the causal effect on it. Um, is going to be marked in red. Um, and we're going to assume a complicated system, somewhat like the previous slide. Um, and just a, a reminder about how we get to draw these graphs. Um, the story is we need some focus, um, effectively a, a design. And if we're interested in um, the effects of, uh, let's say, x on y there, I'm going to be completely abstract through, through, through this. Um, then we are first going to have to figure out what the focus is. The focus here is okay, I'm going to take all ancestors that don't have common causes, and I'm going to bundle them into so-called noise terms and give them a distribution. So I, I turn the system on the left to the system on the right, um, so simply because I'm not particularly interested in, um, in, in all of that upper-level structure. Um, so uh, traditionally, the way one thinks about this is um, there's a, a confounded relation between X and Y. G is still there because it's a common ancestor. 
Um, and if we want to think about actual people, um, I, I believe you're an epidemiology seminar, so people are of some interest, then we might pick those out as having particular values of all these other variables bundled together. So uh, draws from a, a, a three, three distribution here, which I've, I've noted as epsilon. There's the, the standard setup for how we, how we, as it were, generate probability by indifference um, uh, from, a, from an existing causal structure. Okay. So again, just foundational stuff here. Um, we're going to assume the world is made up of mechanisms. I think that's, um, that's a, a view that was very popular in 1750, and it's also a view that's popular again, which is kind of great. Um, so we are, and, and we're going to think about these graphs um, as, as summaries of uh, structural equations, those structural equations are how, how nature actually puts stuff together. So one thing might be how did nature generate those y's anyway, um, and what that graph says is we assume it's something to do with x, something to do with g, and something to do with a whole bunch of other stuff that we're not particularly interested in, which we will bundle as epsilon y. So when we think about a mechanism, the colored parts here, we're just going to uh, think about that as being summarized in the graph. Nature has the details, but the interesting thing for us is that we can say something about, uh, about the structure without knowing them, without knowing the parametric details. Um, people used to talk about carving nature at her joints. These are the joints. Um, key to us here is if we put a probability distribution on, um, on these uh, epsilons, uh, uh, we think of a population uh, from which uh, the people are draws, then, uh, and the rest of this stuff is assumed to be deterministic, then we have induced a joint uh, probability distribution over all of these variables. Um, and the key point for us here is that it has a causal decomposition. That is to say, there is a way of writing the joint distribution of those three variables, which uh, reflects how the system behaves under interventions. And that's gonna be the, the, the heart of our causal uh, story. We want something, uh, we want, probability distributions that will somehow tell us what would happen if we did a thing that we haven't done yet. Um, now, key thing here is that um, all we get from, from joints is uh, a distinctive, hopefully conditional independent structure in the probabilities that are induced. So we're, some, we're gonna connect data to these uh, uh, assumptions about graph, um, not by uh, making parametric models, but, um, but by saying who's conditionally independent of who, conditional on what. So independence and non-independence are in some sense the only interesting quantities um, that will either identify or not identify graphs um, uh, with respect to probability distributions. Okay, so we're interested in observable implications here. Okay, simply that's actually how I'm gonna think about the world um, in the sense that when we see some regularity happening in uh, or some dependencies, uh, and I'm gonna actually think about conditional independencies, then uh, the hope is that um, there's a graph underneath which is making it happen. Um, now to put, um, to put slightly more formality on that, um, this will perhaps be familiar if you've met this stuff before, um, how do we connect uh, probabilities that we might have data to in some sense observe and, and graphs which we uh, as it were, assert or, or, or want to learn about? Well, the two relations on either side are basically we're interested in independence on the probability side and we're interested in a path property called deseparation on the other. Um, the definition is down there, but essentially a feature of the graph structure will tell us who is going to be independent of who, conditional on what. Okay. Um, not usually mentioned in the in the rest here are these two uh, these two criteria, which basically make sure that the top of the previous picture matches the bottom of the previous picture, and vice versa. So. Um, we are usually going to assume, and indeed a lot of this talk is gonna be about not maybe not assuming these things, um, then uh, we, we, we're gonna assume what is called the causal Markov uh, condition, which says um, all variables that are deseparated in the graph, if the graph separates them in a particular way, if the path structure is there, then they're gonna be independent of each other in all distributions, regardless of how the joints get filled out. On the other side, which is gonna be more important to us, this, this idea of faithfulness to the graph, um, so the idea here is that there are no independences that don't trail back to a piece of the graph structure. There's no accidental independence. Um, there's, uh, there's nothing which adds independence, even though you couldn't read it off the graph. Um, so that, um, I'm going to be mostly interested in situations where actually that looks like it fails. Um, it actually doesn't fail, but like that's, that's how we're going to think about it. 
Um, so keep those things in mind and we'll, we'll roll on. Okay, so we need to, uh, in, again, foundational stuff, we need to connect somehow graph structures to, uh, to data. So we're gonna do it via probability. And if we think about this in, um, in terms of what are the uh, probability signatures of particular graph structures, then these three will probably be familiar to you if you've, uh, if you've met this material before. Um, there's one particular structure. Um, we are, and the way I'm gonna uh, uh, draw these things as, as graphs is there's G, it's a common cause of X and Y. Um, X and Y are marginally uh, correlated or associated in some way or other in, in detail that we don't care about, so they're not independent. Um, but if we were to condition on G, they would be. So there is our common cause and an association I've drawn in little blue dotty things, which you shouldn't take very seriously, apart from saying there's some association there, by the way. I can make that go away by conditioning on G. Um, if you fit a measurement model, then that's what you're hoping for. Notation below is just telling you that. So we can condition to remove association. You can think about that as a signature uh, that you would find in data. There's another one. Um, so X causes G causes Y. Um, X and Y definitely are also marginally um, associated. Um, but if I were to uh, condition on G, then I block all of this association and all of a sudden those little blue lines disappear and there's no association. Um, that is in fact the same signature. Um, and uh, those of you who've been uh, taught many times that uh, uh, correlation uh, does not imply causation are nodding your head because these are indeed aliased. Yeah. Um, is this awkward? No, not so much. Um, what we're gonna be interested in today is this one. Um, so there's our collider, G is a collider. That is to say it is a common effect of X and Y. Um, and in this situation, we have things reversed. So um, X and Y by themselves are marginally independent. That's the way I've drawn them. Um, but if I were to condition on G, I would generate extra association. That's the blue dotted line there. Um, so we have the exact opposite signature. Um, uh, this uh, people find uh, uh, permanently non-intuitive um, and, uh, and sort of hope that this is not a major part of, uh, of, their, of their causal inference difficulties. Um, I'm afraid I've come here to remind you that this is a most of your causal inference difficulties that aren't confounding. So basically all the good stuff is, is in uh, this particular problem of generating association between X and Y by conditioning on a common effect, um, which is in some sense spurious. Um, I, I, spurious is a strong word. Actually, I'm gonna make some positive thoughts about that uh, later. Okay, so yes, we did. Um, and those people who do causal discovery will be uh, not surprised to learn that actually it's very useful to have these distinct signatures. Um, and in particular, uh, rather, rather simple, uh, but, but, um, uh, but perfectly correct on assumptions, um, causal discovery algorithms um, will essentially give you a graph on the basis of conditional independence, which is, um, which is correct up to the collider structures. So so-called uh, Markov equivalence class here. Um, so we can indeed learn uh, the, those, although we may not be able to orient the, uh, the, the other arrows. So indeed, we did just infer causation from correlation plus an enormous amount of assumption. So fine. Um, that stuff, that, that's not the only reason why we might care about collider bias. Normally, it's actually going to be a problem. So let me say some bad things about collider bias, and then we will like get a little bit more positive. Um, okay. So as I mentioned, the problem with collider bias is that it's all over the place. And uh, I, I wanna be on record as saying that if it isn't a confounding problem and it is a statistical or a research design problem of some kind, then somewhere in the background, collider bias is doing its thing. Uh, might take a little bit of uh, uh, arranging to find it, but, uh, but, but it's there. So if you're thinking about non-response, we're thinking about over-control, we're thinking about attrition, we're thinking about selection on the dependent variable, the kind of thing that we don't think we ever do, but we sometimes do. We're thinking about survival bias um, or latent homophily, which I'll, I'll talk about the last ones uh, uh, a bit further. Then in the background, there's going to be a piece of collider bias. In my field, Elwood and Winship 2014 is an excellent accounting of all the things that you that can go wrong um, that aren't confounding, um, but are indeed turn out to be uh, turn out to be collider bias. Um, to my considerable annoyance, uh, the epidemiologists are 10 years before us, uh, and uh, this Hanan paper on structural theories of, uh, uh, of collider, uh, there's a uh, like very much the same material in that paper. Um, they're all great, obviously I prefer mine, but um, that's, 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 that's how that goes. Okay, so 
what we want to say here is yes, collider bias is the is the source of all your pain. Um, I think that's that's right. Let's let's have a look at some of the pain before we get optimistic. Um, so one of the uh, there are there are there are examples where it's actually fairly obvious once you draw the graph where the where the collider bias is. Um, one of the cases where that's not so obvious, I think, is uh, oh, I'm going to call this sort of invisible collider bias. I'm I'm implicitly generating some collider bias, but I didn't know that I was doing it because it, it isn't explicit in either notation or the or the graphs. Um, so if we think about this regression setup um, above in a in a beautifully unconfounded regression where x is regressed on y, or we might do something like that anyway. Um, there's a little bit of noise um, on Y, and maybe there's some on X as well, but we have a conditional model, so we don't really care about that. Um, on the other hand, we have selection on X. So X has a large number of values, and we've just, and let's put it this way, let's, we've just chosen a few of them. So selection here, um, I'm simply going to make, or conditioning on M and selecting certain values uh, of X are going to be the same thing here. So that is, that is a selection node. Uh, you should you should read it as of all the cases I'm going to only accept ones where the x is a particular value. Um, that particular selection node is going to cause untold trouble, but also be kind of useful. Um, on the on the part above, you can uh, read off this graph that there are no colliders, so uh, we don't need to worry about it. Um, on the uh, graph on the bottom, then we've decided that we're only going to look at um, positive outcomes, let's say, and condition it on M, and you will immediately see that conditioning on M, looking at only, only certain values of the dependent variable, um, are going to, well, what are they going to do? They're going to couple variables that we tried not to think about with variables that were, uh, that were previously unconnected in X, but are now connected. So this selection on the dependent variable is quietly collider biasing us. Um, Problem here is we can't see them because there's no, the whole purpose of giving a distribution to, to, to Y is so that we wouldn't have to care about individual values of it. So knowing that it is now fundamentally correlated with something that it was previously not um, is, is going to wreck everything basically. So that, that I, I think is a, a, hopefully a, a, a familiar sort of, sort of tale. Um, if you want to think about survival bias, um, well, if you're as terminally online as I am, then you will not have existed um, on the internet without someone yelling at you that what you're really seeing is, uh, is this form of survival bias. Uh, we can think about that as planes that, uh, planes that come back. We are, we are selecting on not having been shot down. Um, and therefore, what we see is a, a weird selection, uh, per, uh, uh, a dependent variable selected uh, version. Now, one of the glorious things about being terminally online is you can be epically wrong about things. Um, so that is indeed not Wald's plane. It's also not Wald's problem. Um, if you read that paper, you can uh, you can learn a much more interesting piece of mathematics about um, about how that works. Um, but for now, um, we'll remain terminally online. Okay. Perhaps you weren't expecting this, or perhaps if there are students in the room, you have a slightly like pit of your stomach, oh God, feeling about this. Um, so one of the one of the nice things about being um, uh, being a research methods person interested in causal inference is that you can take um, problems uh, which uh, look like difficult probability problems and turn them into problems which uh, you still don't understand but are causal inference problems. Um, so this this kind of switch is kind of fun, at least if you're me. So one of the things uh, I want to suggest here, and you'll see why I'm doing it in a moment, is that when you think of classic probability problems where there is a deeply unintuitive piece of information that you weren't expecting, Monty Hall is one of those, um, uh, then you are, you are probably running into something which is, which is also adjacent to, 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 um, to causal inference. So on the left there, um, a reminder uh, for, for those of you who haven't run into this problem, um, actually, I'm, I'm just going to get you to look it up because it's epic. Um, we have three doors. Um, there's a car behind some, one of them. There's two goats behind the other. And we have a game show host who, when you choose one door, will open another one to reveal a goat. And, uh, and then you decide whether to choose to uh, switch your door because there's one left. Now, one thing that's always upset me about this problem is that I would always choose the goat. That's actually highly preferable to the car. But let, let us imagine that, um, that we're somehow interested in cars or conceivably could sell the car and get more goats. So what's the structure of this problem? Well, it goes a little bit like this. So here's a, a realistically interesting sort of DAG over here. Um, let's, let's treat C as 
as the door behind which the car is. Um, I've drawn it uh, open because we don't know what that is from our perspective. Um, DF there is the, the door that I've chosen first. Maybe I've, maybe I've chosen the first door. Um, the game show host who opens uh, uh, to reveal a goat, um, there is a, there's a goat um, underneath uh, door three. Um, because this door must open to a goat, then you have to not choose the car. So there's a negative causal effect there. And you have to not choose the, uh, the door that I chose. Choose another one. So uh, his decision depends on both of these. Um, now, we're actually interested in the following uh, causal effect. There's me possibly switching to another door. So there's my first door and there's my second door and maybe they're the same one if I don't switch. Switch decides that. Um, or maybe they, uh, or, or maybe maybe I maybe I change. Um, and if I'm interested in winning, then uh, okay, what uh, whether I win depends on whether this second door I choose is the same door as the car. So there's there's that causal structure. Um, as I said, the the causal effect of interest is should I switch? What's the basically what's the average treatment effect of S? Yeah. So I'm switching. Um, my second door depends on what my first door was because I wouldn't switch if I, if I chose the same one. Um, it also depends on which door um, the game show host opened, so it depends on G, um, and then it ends up in, in, in W. Now, what's surprising about this setup? Well, I guess what everyone is confused about um, is the fact that switching is helpful. Um, and from our perspective, the, the reason switching is helpful is because there is a collider structure in here, this one. Um, when I uh, decide whether to uh, switch my door, then I condition on it, which means immediately I get this association here. And we're not in sample here. This is a one person, one, you know, one man, two goats kind of situation. Perhaps that came out wrong. The thought here is that once I see which, uh, uh, which door is, uh, is, has been opened to reveal the goat, then I also know what my first, um, my first door was, um, and the the nature of the association that's built up here is all of a sudden my first door choice is informative about where the car is. So I have this negative association because uh, if we think about this as a sort of quasi-linear system, there's a positive effect, there's another positive effect, they have the same sign, so I should have expect my collider bias to be negative. So if I first chose this door, it's slightly more likely that I'm wrong. Um, so that, in some sense, is information. That's, uh, that's an association which is, which is genuinely useful for decision-making purposes. Um, but so cognitively, that's, that's great. Um, here, it's actually just collider bias at work. Um, we, we wouldn't get anywhere had we not been able to condition on G, or indeed had G not been conditioned on C, so we had lost the, lost the structure. Okay, so I don't know whether that made, uh, made, made Monty Hall more or less comprehensible than the last time you banged your head against it. Um, what I would like to, you to take away here is that, that the structure is something that you may have met in a textbook. So if we, uh, if we think about uh, defining M bias, so this is the, the situation where something that looks like a confounder is in fact um, some kind of collider. So here is our M. So there is the, the path of interest, maybe starting here actually, um, and our confounding has the, has the structure of something which uh, confounds this and confounds that. There is our M. Um, conditioning on the middle, which we ne necessarily do, is going to set up this path and change our chances of winning. Um, so that's a positive, we're already kind of on the way to it being a positive thing that there's a little bit of collider bias in here. This information is actually useful for something, even if we find it non-intuitive to make use of. Um, that kind of um, collider bias inference is actually goes deep, as it were. So uh, I have an example which you can ask me about afterwards with, uh, uh, with visual illusions, um, in, uh, which makes the case that basically this kind of inference is, is built in so deep into the visual system that, uh, that you can't not see things that way, and that this is, this is good. Um, Monty Hall is a case where it's just hard to see. So what, uh, in case you thought that M-bias was just a sort of cute example to say that no, no, when you think about confounding, you really actually have to have the confounder causing on a causal path with the, um, uh, the independent and dependent variable, then they're not just kidding. These, these situations do turn up. Um, but on the assumption that you're not uh, often finding yourself choosing cars and goats, um, what sort of situations would those be? Um, well, here's one. 
Um, so maybe you're interested, if you are, let's say, James Fowler in uh, the early 2000s, about what can you learn from social networks? Nothing good, TLDR. Um, so you can, um, if you, maybe you're interested in, in, in contagion, right? So you have a great, uh, a great data set and uh, someone starts to do something um, illegal, unhealthy, or, or unsound in some way, and you're interested in what sort of effects that, that has on their friends. Um, now, it came as a slight shock to my part of the world, perhaps to epidemiologists, this is no news, uh, but that, that there are, as it were, certain difficulties in dealing with, with social network data from the causal inference perspective. So let's, let's set this up. Um, there's some current observed behavior. There's a why for me and there's a why for you. I'm interested in whether something you do makes me do it in the next time step. So you do a thing and at T plus one, or, or you do it at T minus one and at T maybe I do it. I'm interested in that effect. Um, so I've got two readings from, from me and me in the past and you and you in the past. Um, and there's unobserved characteristics about us, which are shared across these time steps, our, our own fixed effects, if, I, if I'm in a room full of economists. Um, we'll call those you. Um, and then we're interested, well, here's the, here's the following challenge. By the way, we have, um, we have an indicator which tells us whether we're friends or not. Um, and that's the data we have. So we have data consisting of friends. And the challenge is, can you non-parametrically identify the effect of your action in the past on mine in the present. So did, did you make me do it? Um, so the difficulty level of this problem is impossible um, in the sense that we need to make more assumptions or have different design for these things. Um, so if we wanna think about these graphs, there's me on the left, there's you on the right, we look kind of the same. Um, there's our, our, our individual use, our, uh, our driving what we did um, and so that's the causal effect of interest. Um, you at T minus one to me at T. Um, we're friends, and this is unfortunate um, because we have, um, not, not only because you make me do things that I don't wanna do, but uh, we have, we're, by hypothesis, social network data of friends. Um, and so if uh, once we choose a, a data set full of people who are friends, then we have effectively conditioned on F. Um, we didn't feel like we were conditioning on F. We didn't see that happen. That's just the nature of network data. Um, on the other hand, it does generate uh, this particular problem, which is it's a collider, effectively, which means that if there's something about me and something about you, uh, then these are now going to be coupled even if they were independent. So if we want to think about this as bias. There's our, uh, there's our effect of interest. But here's a backdoor path that has just opened up by choosing a friendship data set rather than a random one, which is now confounding the whole thing. Um, and we can't not do that because that's the nature of our data. Okay. Um, if, you, uh, if you're very good at mental manipulation, I understand that some people are, then you can kind of squidgel your eyes up and see that to be M bias again. So there is our M. Um, okay. So that's a, that's a situation uh, which actually I want to lean on a little bit here because uh, at least in my world, uh, we have, a, um, we have a, a standard difficulty, which I'll, I'll elaborate in a bit, which is that it's not at all always obvious uh, when the, uh, what the data sets that we have to work with are conditioned on. And usually they're conditioned on something that we were, as it were, not thinking about too carefully. Um, I'll go into that in a bit more detail later. Okay. Later is now, by the way. Let's go into that detail now. Um, so here's a piece of work uh, from, uh, well, uh, a piece of work I, I worked on um, uh, when I was, uh, uh, before I came in to, to Berlin, um, on a, a policy question which exercised me and my colleagues. Um, the policy question is essentially, what is the effect of race on the police use of force in the US? So we are in a uh, uh, Floyd protest kind of uh, era at this point. Um, but I mean, this is an ongoing concern. Uh, it's just that it just flares up from time to time. So uh, the, the causal, there's, there's a lot of difficulties with this causal question. It's the causal effect of race, which is already like tricky to think about. Um, very happy to talk about that later. That's not gonna be the focus today. Um, but it's certainly an important policy question because you know people die. And 
In this case, we have excellent data, or, or this field has excellent data. So we have the New York Police Department's SQF records. SQF here stands for stop, question, and frisk. So uh, I, I see someone, I think they look a little sketchy during the period that SQF is going on, and then I, I search them. Something happens in this interaction, sometimes it's violent. Um, and then I write down what happened. Uh, including like uh, what they look like beforehand, um, uh, what happened, and then and then then outcomes. Um, these records are voluminous, uh, and this was a period where huge amounts of stops were made. This is, I guess, a broken windows kind of deal in in New York, and so police were encouraged to make lots and lots of um, stops, and 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 uh, and so we have a lot of these records, and they're probably usually okay. Um, there was a famous piece of, uh, of social science work by, by Fryer in 2018, um, which I think most people found kind of shocking in the field. So they were like, okay, so um, we, we know sort of intuitively that um, uh, you can have a bad time being not white in, uh, uh, when dealing with police in, 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 in this case, New York City, but, but in general. Um, and so we expect there to be quite substantial differences in the use of force across races. Um, uh, what he found was after controlling for a large number of things and using the SQF records that there doesn't seem to be any difference at all. So black people who are being shot or whatever at the, at the same rate as whites um, and so on for different, like less drastic levels of force. Um, this was a, uh, this was a striking, uh, striking result. Um, and on the right there, you can see uh, that's the Wall Street Journal being being very enthusiastic to discover that despite the fact that it appears that lots of people die at the hands of police, it at least isn't differential. Um, now, I've, I've noted here that, that, uh, that that's a question answered wrongly. Um, if you've been uh, following thus far, then you'll have, I think, probably some idea about why it's being um, addressed wrongly. Um, but let's, uh, let's, let's pull this together as collider bias. So, how do we want to think about this situation? Um, so here's what we came up with. Uh, the thought here is, there's your race. Um, and the structure of this data is in some sense generated by the following graph. Um, so my, my race may uh, get me stopped. Uh, and, but of course, other things depend. Uh, uh, so being stopped uh, occurs for other reasons. Um, some of those reasons, let's say A there, are unobserved, that is to say they are not in the data. Um, something about my demeanor, something about the officer, we don't have any of that stuff. Uh, and some of it is, is, is observed, there's B, I'm currently robbing a bank and therefore I, I, I probably will get stopped. Um, once I do get stopped, then we're in a police interaction. There's a record of it, we'll call that Q for quantified. So it turns into a record and then something happens. Uh, so once I'm in that situation, there is this effect here on the use of force. So if I'm robbing a bank, use of force is more likely. If I'm doing something sketchy that's not in the data, use of force is more likely. But uh, I can't, we are going to assume here that um, I have to be stopped first. So that's a sort of a gate, as it were. And so all those things generate use of force. Once I'm in one of these interactions, we can think about this effect, which is once I've been stopped by the police, what's the role of race in all of this? So how does it go down once the stop has happened? Um, so there's a lot of, there are probably more than 99 problems with this kind of, uh, th this kind of work. Um, in particular, the policy, the policy estimand is a little bit unclear. So just in the background, uh, I'm not going to claim the collider bias is the most interesting thing here, but, but it is, uh, uh, it is one of them. Um, so question, uh, you will probably look at that, uh, look at that graph and say, okay, so you've just drawn a mediation problem. That is a mediation problem. Right? So. There's the, there's the mediator, S. Um, it's a little bit tricky because we're also sample selecting on it. So we don't actually get every value of the mediator and this is gonna to matter to us. Um, and then we have to decide what kind of estimate we want. So uh, this literature and that paper doesn't really say very much about that. Um, but one sort of sensible estimate would be um, of all the people who are stopped, what's this direct effect? Or alternatively, what's the total effect of race on being stopped and also things going badly when that happens? Um, and then controlling for these guys. You'll also recognize these guys as the worst possible confounders. They are the mediator outcome things that you were told to worry about in mediation analysis. 
Uh, actually, probably in this room, people are deeply skeptical about mediation analysis, so I don't need to say that. Um, so the, the estimate is a little bit unclear. This is a mediation problem, um, and our fundamental difficulty is that we're getting a subset of the population because Q is a selection node and we are conditioning on it, except we're not. Actually, the New York uh, City Police Department is conditioning on it because that's the nature of the data. It only comes once a policeman stops you. Otherwise, there's no data. So it's implicitly conditioned on S. Now, once we do that, um, we, are, we are implicitly conditioned on S because we're explicitly conditioned on Q, which means then that all of these characteristics here are deeply collider biased. So if race was independent of uh, your bad behavior or your tendency to rob a bank, it won't be after we've done the stopping. Um, so we have unbalanced the sample um, that, that gets stopped. Um, intuitively for this problem, um, uh, people who get stopped are incredibly dangerous white guys and incredibly dangerous black guys and also not very dangerous black guys. And that is not in any sense a sort of random comparison. So if you see uh, those two groups being compared to one another and you see that they are having force used at, uh, at the same rate, something terrible has happened because it shouldn't be the same rate in some sense because these are, these are very differently dangerous people. Um, so we get we get strongly biased policing. You're welcome to read about the um, uh, the detail there. For our purposes, this is collider bias. Um, for our purposes, again, this is built into the data structure, so we are necessarily conditional there. And yeah, if we think about it like that, I want to say uh, so. This might be a good a good time to say this is what I want to call the administrative data DAG. So this is a structure which. Uh, turns up again and again in administrative data because um, if you uh, something has to happen and all of a sudden you're in a data set and for government or administrative data in general that's a very common pattern right so you have to get stopped by a police uh, a, a police officer to to end up in the sqf data but we don't think about it another way um, what's the slightly more epidemiologically so uh, we're interested in the effect of you wearing a helmet on let's say head injuries um, but you have hospital records. Well, this is you know this is this is selected um, in, in a way that's kind of awkward, um, and so we should expect um, we should expect all kinds of collider bias here. Um, many of you will be thinking about birth weight paradoxes. This is absolutely the general story about that. Okay. All right. So that there is something deeply general about conditioning on Q. Okay. Enough bad news. Let's have some positive news. So. What, what could you do with this stuff? So here's a thought. Um, you actually know um, already, uh, actually, uh, epidemiologists are, are the one of the few groups that are, that are actually aware that, uh, that collider bias is being, is in some sense a way to think about matching. Um, so apologies, this is normally newer to people, but we, we, we should think about it anyway. Um, so let's think about matching. We have a, uh, we have a confounding problem. Um, there's G being confounding. Um, so the way to think, uh, uh, I think, about matching is to say, I'm going to invent a matching indicator. Um, and that's going to be, and I've drawn this in blue here, because I want to think about this as a harness that you stick on the, on the world or on the data. So there is a way that the world is arranged, and there is also what I have chosen to do. What extra causal structure have I put on top? Um, and in this case, it's I've just invented a variable M which is going to be my matching indicator. And then it's my job to spell out what that variable looks like. Definitely depends on X and G. Um, and if I want to think about this as a, as a matching exercise, then my, my, my function doesn't, I mean, it's not particularly parametric, but it's algorithmic in the sense that if I think about 1-1 matching, then I'm going to walk down all of my X, the X values of all of my, my people. Um, let's assume that X is binary, then fine. Um, we'll set it, if it's one, then I'm gonna look for an X equals zero with the same set of confounders, and maybe I find them, and I give you both one on the matching indicator, and I do that as much as I can, and then I stop, and everybody else gets zero. Next step, condition on the matching indicator, so throw away everybody who didn't manage to find a pair. Um, and what I've got here is something which if you were, if you didn't know that matching occurred, would look like faith, a failure of faithfulness. So, if the world is really organized on the left, then what I'm getting is a data set which uh, actually would have been organized, uh, would have been generated by the structure on the right, where there is in fact no confounding because group is now independent of of X. So that conditioning has generated a subset 
as if the world were a way that I would prefer. Now, background here, uh, lots of people want to think about um, causal inferences as, as, as the, the, act, the, the, uh, the business of finding identifying variation, that is to say, finding something like, like this guy. Um, maybe here I'd need it to be an instrument, but here it would be great. Like that would just be my, I could randomize the study and then fine, that would, that, that, this graph would be accurate. I want to think about it as, uh, uh, so one, one other sort of complementary way to think about um, these things is as how can, I, how can I make relationships that confound, specifically that one in this case, um, as if they weren't there at all. So how can I null out that, cancel it out? And that's going to be, that's going to be important for, for where we're going here. Um, now, we can think about propensity scores the same way. Um, there's a certain ambiguity in this, um, in this literature as to whether the propensity score is the real one um, or the one that you estimate. Let's think about the real one. That's not a collider bias problem. There's the real one marked in P. I'm going to pretend we don't know what it is. For a survey researcher, we probably do know what it is, but, but, or an experimentalist, but, uh, but, but here we're going to assume we don't know what it is. It is the closest variable to X. Great. Um, then it is what this literature refers to as a balancing score. That is to say, conditional on P, X, and G are independent. And that's exactly the kind of independence that we want. Unfortunately, we don't know what it is. Um, thus far, we're simply finding a variable in the middle of a path and conditioning on it. Nothing new there. But maybe we don't know it. So if we don't know it, then we're estimating it. It's going to be a function that we invent from G and X there. Um, so our p hat there, that quantity that we're going to be interested in, in conditioning on or waiting by or whatever you like, um, is going to be something which is a function of g and x, which conditional on that, there's no extra association between g and x. It's going to, so that little dotted blue line there is saying that completely cancels the, the black line. So great. That's, that's actually collider bias. And then uh, the collider bias is exactly offsetting what the path would do. Um, that's going to be generally useful. Um, the eagle-eyed among you will be thinking, how does this work with case control? And then you'll, in your heads, because you're all arch mental manipulators, you will flip around the uh, device and say, well, what if I were to estimate something which is a function of G and Y? And that would indeed be a case control indicator, something that chooses on, on the basis of the outcome, but also on the basis of the covariance. Not going to, not going to go into that. When I'm in front of uh, economists, then, um, then they like Mundlack devices. Um, I don't know how familiar those, uh, that terminology is from here. I, 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 it gives a certain kind of spy movie for to, to my to my research, thinking about activating the Mundlack device. I'm not sure Mundlack would have appreciated that. But if we start with Frisch Wall Lovell, um, uh, again, apologies uh, to, to, to students who've met this too recently, then what we get um, is the guarantee that uh, and think of this as a generalization of the propensity score sort of story, that if we were to be able to estimate the expected value of X given G, then we could, for example, subtract it from X. That would be an adjustment mechanism, um, and that would work. Um, depends on the functional details. But maybe we don't want to do that. Um, so we'll consider here the situation which is a little bit more, compli a little bit more complicated. Um, and in fact, let me, let me consider the situation where there's a bunch of X, Y relationships, and, but G is a grouping indicator. So it's a subpopulation or a place, or, and we have a lot of X, Y people in there. So they, they, are, um, uh, we, they are, as it were, exchangeable within values of, of G. One thing to note about that situation is that it's the standard multi-level situation. I have, I have groups and I have people. So uh, in my world, it's basically surveys and countries or, or something like that. Uh, within countries. Um, in this case, um, what's kind of striking about the, uh, to me at least, about the DAG uh, drawing is that I can't draw that. It's actually not available to me as a, as a, in this formalism. I can't say this G is shared by all of these guys. Um, uh, Kim and Steiner have some nice stuff on, on thinking about this, but it, it's going to rely on, yeah, more, more, more machinery than I, than I require, specifically plates. Also happy to talk about that afterwards. But let's, let's, let's think about it as that situation. How do we get around uh, this confounding a G, which is currently the group level? Well, one intuition here from, from Mundlach is that if you were to figure out what the average X was in any particular one of these groups, then that is about the only thing that being a member of a group could change because it's shared among all the members. So fine, we'll have the average X. That is the Mundlach device. Um, 
Now, the key thing about this is, well, two things, really. First of all, this operates exactly the same way as all the others. So conditional on knowing the average x for all of our groups, then that's, that's all I need to close down this, this confounding path. So that's a cancellation right there. Um, for extra added bonus, if you like multi-level models, but you like, but you think that the effect of G is um, either different or in another direction, or you would like to estimate it separately from the effect of, of X, um, then we can think about between within models and decompose our X into the adjusted part and then the Muntlak device. So if you bung both of those in a, in a regression, they'll get two separate coefficients. And one of them will be between and one of them will be within variation. Um, and that will get us a long, long way, actually. Um, those models are under um, understudied in economics, but uh, overstudied in sociology. And so you can be right there in the middle. Okay. We talked a lot about cancellation. That is to say, we talked about what would you have to condition on, set up, rearrange new variables so that these things, which are definitely associated because they're definitely have a causal relationship with one another, would turn out to be canceled, as it were, that the, the, the association would be zero, as if they were in fact not causal. Um, so let's talk a little bit about cancel. Okay. Here are the other ways to get canceled. I showed you a bit of collider bias. We'll get back to collider bias. Don't think I'm changing the subject here. Though. We'll, we'll, we'll be there. But here are the classical ways that we worry about, about cancellation. These are, from the earlier slide, these are faithfulness failures. So there's a, a simplistic kind of linear normal, like make your favorite assumptions kind of situation on the top, which is, which is a confounding one, and one on the bottom, which is a mediation one. Um, and we'll just lay, those, those Greek letters there are just labeling the effects. Um, just so that I can say, um, I have this nice system, but look, um, in the situation that alpha times gamma minus beta is zero, that's a complete perfect cancellation. Right? One implication of that is that both of those diagrams show you an enormous amount of causation happening between X and Y, and the association, I hope, will be clear is zero, because whatever association beta generated, then the other path canceled it out. So that's, that's kind of like what we would worry about. And the, uh, one natural sort of thought here is, a, that would never happen, and B, but I have this faithfulness assumption. So there aren't any like independences that I wasn't expecting from the graph, and that would be a very surprising independence here. Um, so indeed, um, you can be fancy about it. You can say, look, in, 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 in random samples, uh, then exact cancellation has Lebesgue measure zero, so like, you won't find this. Um, that's actually even less optimistic than you would hope because there are a large number of situations where you're quite close to cancel, but not there. That volume of that space is quite large. But in any case, it's also not true. Um, so the hope that like we would never run into these situations um, founders more or less immediately, um, at least for the, for the normal circumstances in my, in my part of the world, possibly also in yours. Okay. So informally, you might have run into this, uh, this, these claims. Um, no one has moved their hands lately, so I wonder if you could just kind of just edge up your finger to see if the Goodhart's Law or Campbell's has like entered your life at some point. Absolutely none. Okay, congratulations. Um, I, I'm here to spoil that. So one thought uh, uh, that you, you will see bandied around in, in various literatures is what goes by the name of Goodhart's Law. Goodhart was a, um, uh, an English banker um, who said, look, um, when a government tries to find a regularity which measures something interesting um, and use it for control, that is to say, use it to uh, change interest rates or, or move something structural around in the economy, then, uh, then that regularity will disappear. So there's going to be a regularity in the world. If it matters to someone whether they get those things, then implicitly they are going to lean on it such that it stops working. So the world has in fact not changed. We just have purposive actors like noticing what it is that you depend on. So that's going to be a, a general kind of equilibrium problem. Um, the, the, the slightly less, um, less banking oriented version, this, this is from Campbell. Um, Basically, there are corruption pressures. Um, so in monitoring or governance or whatever situations, then if you know what the indicators are, they will, they will, they will, they will get, get messed with. 
Um, okay, so how, I was, I was not sure whether I should put this in, but um, with apologies for, uh, to those people who stared at this last night, um, this is Josh Clinton um, writing for uh, an American uh, news agency, uh, looking at uh, various uh, estimates about polls in in countries. The da uh, in county, uh, sorry, in states um, in the U.S., you are um, the dark colors. There are how much variation there is among the polls uh, or poll aggregators in this case, and then the shaded part that you can hopefully see there is how much variation you might expect. Uh, if these were just like random samples from that. And the concern here is they're a bit narrow. So something has, shall we say, positively correlated and therefore variance has gone down somewhere among them. And the thought here is maybe maybe they're following each other. They're, they're not, in fact, like those, those randomness assumptions aren't there. Um, but if you're following each other, then you're in a control relationship. That is to say, if you're a company that says, um, I think this is, uh, a, this is a blowout for, for candidate X, and then another company looks at you and goes, wow, they think that maybe I should edge towards them. Boom, you're correlated. And so we're not going to get random samples here. That's a, that would be an instance of like uh, making use of, uh, of information in a way that kind of is going to wreck the regularity. So now, uh, that if that's true, and still have no idea whether that is true, then now we have a measure which doesn't act, which stops uh, stops measuring, as it were, public sentiment and starts measuring other pollsters um, or has some mix of those, which is unfortunate. Okay. This is normally a measurement problem. So um, so let's let's just uh, let's let's go through the possibilities for measurement here. Um, we're talking about measurement failure, and again, we'll 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 get back to to how how our cancellation, our, our, our collider bias thing matters here. But the very, probably the second thing you learn uh, when you take a class on measurement models, so if you fit IRT or you're, you've generated indexes from, from, from questionnaire results, or uh, maybe, God help you, you've done factor analysis at some point, uh, I, I forgive you, then you might have worried about the following situation. That's the one on the left. This is in some sense the quite boring one that says, there's something I want to measure. Maybe it's, it's your belief in something. Um, and there's an indicate. I have three indicators, questions on a questionnaire, um, and I am interested in uh, getting a measurement model. That is to say, that structure up there. I, I want to say that for 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 serious measurement, you actually do want the construct to cause the items. Like this is a going to be a causal story in an ideal world. Um, so that's actually the that's our conditional independence uh, structure or uh, local independence as the measurement model people would call it and it's been wrecked here by a by a variable called s which unfortunately determines what you say on item three so if s is your country then uh, you may have the same value of theta but uh, but different countries tend to set, tend to as it were put their value higher or lower on that indicator and if we don't know that then then we have different differential item functioning. So that, that's the boring variety. Like you, uh, we're not we're not going to worry about that. A bit closer to us is this. So maybe our indicator is not actually gloriously causal, or it is confounded. That is to say, people uh, people in different countries have different values of theta, but they also answer the question differently. And so now we're we're kind of stuck. Um, why would we run into this? Um, well, there are a lot of mundane examples, but you didn't come here to hear mundane examples. So let's have a more drastic example. Um, does anyone recognize that thing on the right? I would be absolutely terrified if you did, actually. That's a, um, uh, that's a Siemens controller, um, in this case being used to spin centrifuges in the Iranian nuclear program. Um, so uh, a little while ago, some of you may be old enough to remember that there was a, uh, a computer worm virus, whatever you want to call it, called Stuxnet, um, constructed by, by person and people's unknown, but definitely not the US and Israel. And they put, um, uh, we, it's going to, uh, the S there is going to stand for Stuxnet. And the way that thing works is um, uh, every now and again, we're going to inject a bit of noise into theta, which is how fast this centrifuge is running or how well the, the mechanism is going. And at the same time as I inject a little bit of noise, I'm going to adjust the dial, which says how fast it's running to make sure that no one can tell. Uh, eventually this thing will blow up or, or melt down or it generally kind of like, uh, uh, we will either destroy the machine or, 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 or whatever. 
Um, so that, that's a piece of confounding, which is, which is extremely concrete. Um, it's extremely, it's a control relation, which, uh, which the Siemens controller was not expecting. Um, it's also, um, if we want to think about this more widely, and, and here I must admit that although I was introduced as having a BA in psychology, I have a BA in philosophy. Sorry about that. So we won't get, um, uh, we won't get past this. Um, this is actually a weaponized Duhem problem. Um, so what I mean by that is the coin Duhem problem, if you've not run into it before, is that if I have a theory, let's say this is the way you build nuclear things, and if I have a measurement, which is when I spin centrifuges, this machine will tell me whether it's spinning too fast, but things can go wrong if I, my theory is wrong or my centrifuge thing is wrong, then if I see something failing, then I need to blame either my measurement device or my theory. But if someone has nobbled my measurement device, then I tend to think my theory is wrong. So that is indeed the exact mechanism that we're working on here. So this is, this is as it were, controlled measurement failure. Um, with, with an aim to making people think that they don't know what they're doing. Okay. There's the other one. Let's let's think about that last one, and that's that's gonna that's gonna wrap us up here, um, because it's gonna be the for me the most important, but also the, the, the trickiest thing that we have here. That's a mediated item response function. Um, for measurement problems that I've described to you before, maybe this isn't the best like way to think about this, but um, but let's let's do the example that I've I've noted down there. So there is a measure. Um, we'll think about I3 as being an exam result. Um, and we'll think about your ability as being the thing that that exam measures. Um, now, it might be that that's a great exam. It does indeed is sensitive to differences in, in measurement. So it's working very nicely as an item. Obviously, it'll be made of other items, but, uh, but we'll just think about it in, in the single case there. Um, and the thought here is that uh, maybe if you know you're not very good, you go get a private tutor. And, and that improves your, your exam result. So. Uh, this is this is Goodhart's law in action in some sense because now a fairly effective exam is actually a mixture of people who've been tutored and not tutored, and so it is now less sensitive to your ability because if you weren't good enough, theta causes s and you get the tutor. So maybe uh, maybe this is failing. Uh, if tutors are very good and there's a full blown industry, not thinking of any countries in particular for that then you can uh, effectively cancel out the relationship between theta and I. So the exam is no longer informative because our second route, our indirect route has uh, via the, the, the presence of a tutor has canceled it out. Um, okay, so that is indeed, we're back to, back to cancellation here. So let's look at this just for a moment a bit more and then we'll wrap it up. So there are some uh, parametric details here which actually are not gonna, gonna exercise us, but, but just for, um, for the record, let's have a look at um, a simple control system which has the same structure. That thing on the, you're looking at on the on the left, you'll notice how it just is the uh, the mediation setup that we saw before. There's a bunch of other stuff on there. So what 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 is the bunch of other stuff? Well, I've made it kind of parametric. So now, if I want to know what g is, um, then I know that it's caused by x, but it's also parameterized. So there are going to be a bunch of alpha parameters which which actually tell me something about what the what that functional form is. Now, I don't know, necessarily know what they are. Um, there's another bunch of parameters, we'll call them beta, which determine the x to, the, the, um, the x to y relationship there. So we can think about that as a parameterized system and just we'll, we'll not worry about the harness for the, for the moment. Now, if you're, here's a, an example from uh, Shalizzi um, for a, from a while ago, trying to formalize the idea of what we will call Milton Friedman's thermostat. So this is a simple, simple control system where we're, we're saying um, there's outdoor temperature, there's indoor temperature. We would like indoor temperature to be constant. Um, and there's a, there's a heating system. So basically outdoor temperature would directly make indoor temperature colder. So that, that's the, the X to Y relationship. But I can cancel that effect out by carefully arranging um, my central heating system to either raise the temperature or lower it. And that is our indirect effect there. And it's parameterized. So we can work through the control things, but the, the key point here is if, if this is a good control system, then Y is constant, which means that Y is independent of X. So all of this causation is entirely invisible. So there, if you were to just look at this data, then, then Y would be a constant. So it's absolutely independent of everything. Um, so the in, that's, that's in equilibrium, should we say? And we are now explicitly thinking about equilibrium. 
Um, out of equilibrium, when suddenly there's a cold snap and the temperature needs to rise and fall, it probably doesn't do it immediately, and we can see this structure. So, as it were, we are faithful to this structure as long as we're not quite doing how we're designed. If we're designed we, uh, uh, properly, then we, we hit an equilibrium quite fast, and all of a sudden x becomes independent of y, um, which in that case is kind of what we want. Um, remind you of anything? This is this is an, a, a classic failure of inference. Uh, I've chosen a um, chosen a good epidemiological example. I'm sorry if you had to suffer through the entire pandemic listening to people like this. Uh, the clearly you don't need to do these medical things because no one dies of these things anymore. It's like yes, these these facts are somehow related, but but okay. That's the independence that we're looking at here, or the the, the cancellation. Um, so. This also occurs in my in my field a lot. So here's Chris Blattman. He uh, um, studies all kinds of things, conf uh, conflict redistribution, all kinds of all kinds of good stuff. Um, and this is the kind of thing that you won't read in the paper, which is why I'm giving you like Twitter excerpts here because like this is the sort of thing that actually happens, but but it's a little bit awkward to write down. Um, so they're, they're doing a public lottery. Um, they want to, if you give a, give um, a bunch of people in, in Liberia some, some money, um, then will they, as it were, start a business or do something cool with it? Um, but of course, Liberians being smart folk um, actually said, well, it seems sort of unfair that I'll get money and, and you'll be randomized not to have money. So they set up uh, in advance um, uh, the deal where they'd insure each other. So you get the money and then I give you know, an eighth of it to each of you. So everyone effectively gets the money, super violation to uh, all the way. Um, but that is a cancellation, right? So there's something, there's an effect there which I've effectively canceled by an insurance scheme. And that is absolutely general. Um, it also, as he put it, unravels the field experiment. So this field experiment just doesn't work anymore. Um, that is because people are effectively too smart for it. Um, and that, that ought to be like the general expectation. Um, indeed, and this is a pilot study. So the real study has things to avoid this. But like that's that's the kind of cancellation that that uh, that we're worried about. Um, I didn't say very much about S there, so let me let me say that and then stop. Um, so S there is a little bit of uh, we can think about that as how did you choose those parameters? Um, so we have a situation where we've generated unfaithfulness. Uh, there's there's an independence which is absolutely not predicted by the graph uh, because it cancels. Um, so, and most values of parameters in that system, if we think about it as designing a thermostat, most of them are actually terrible thermostats. They, they don't, they, they heat you up too much or cool you down too much, or they're indifferent to the temperature or whatever. Just a randomly chosen set of alphas and betas there just won't work. Uh, we need the ones that put you into this equilibrium situation. So when we're doing that, we're sort of training our thermostat or someone is designing it, then actually we're thinking about forming the function which maps the parameters to some objective function, which is get yourself to equilibrium. So this is the training process here. Um, it's also a process that you could learn, or if you're in a biological situation, it's the sort of thing that's selected. So we can think about hard selection means that you, you do what you, what you need to do more effectively. And so of all the alphas and betas that are out there, the ones we actually see are the ones that, are like, that, that, uh, that generate this, this unfaithfulness. So it is indeed faithful, but only if you consider all of the, all of the possible values um, that we didn't in fact see or were not in fact realized. Um, like before, this is, I want to say, administrative data is the paradigm example of this. So it's a data set which is implicitly conditioned on people trying to do a thing. And that is, that's going to blow like a lot of our, of our causal leverage. Um, and that fundamentally is the sort of, is, is the problem. Um, it's also the solution. In this case, I said I would be positive about collider bias. Think this is collider bias. So I condition on, on the objective function and I get alphas and betas that work, that make, that make the system do what it needs to do but also make it look like something else. Okay. So my, my takeaway from all this is that um, background here, I, I teach two courses at Hertie. Um, one of them is um, on causal inference, where I, I try desperately to find things that are approximately randomized or nearly randomized or as good as randomized. And in the other course, uh, I teach uh, applied decision theory, where I say, actually, you're going to use these causal effects and then target your treatment. And that's actually how this is going to go. You choose who gets stuff. Um, and these courses uh, sit very unhappily to one another, right? So if I'm doing a very good job in my decision theory course, I'm making my life very hard in the causal class. 
and vice versa. Right? So if things work in the, uh, for, for learning about causal effects um, in, in the causal class, then actually decisions are, are, be, are failing to be made uh, appropriately on that side. Um, and that is, that's our, that's our dilemma. So our, re our research is ideally randomized. The people are optimizing pretty much all the time. Um, so if you think about markets, they clear. Um, government regulations offset uh, negative externalities sometimes with the wind in the right direction. So we have a bad effect, which has a, a negative direct effect. Um, maybe we, we can't avoid that. And so we put something in place, some regulation or some extra bit of machinery to offset the effects, making the road better makes people drive faster and they die, fine. So I put speed cameras in as an indirect effect to offset that. And all of a sudden road quality is no longer related to dead people. That's, that's how that, that goes. Um, so indeed, there's, there's, there's some failed RCTs being danced into the grave. Um, okay, that's, that's actually where I want to, uh, where I want to end us here. Um, so that was Collider Bias, the, the bad side, the good side. And then the more, as a general interesting question of which collider bias is the general cause, um, which is this cancellation issue, which is like right where I am right now and where a bunch of my field uh, hopefully will, will, will find it interesting to go. So thanks for your attention.